very happy tonight to welcome back Patrick Morris, Pat Morris, who I think spoke to us must be about three years ago now on his uh, subject which he, which he is most associated the history of taxidermy. But having learned that he was doing uh, this review of a subject dear to the hearts of many ornithologists, the Hastings rarities, it seemed uh, too good an opportunity to miss not to invite him back to talk on this as well. As you probably all know, Pat is actually uh, really a, a mammologist uh, and was for many years an academic in Royal Holloway College. But he also takes an interest in other life forms, in particular when it comes to anything that involves taxidermy, such as birds do, and has been doing a great deal of work recently looking into, again, the Hastings rarities and the implications and acceptance of fraud in the Asian rarities has for the reputation of certain taxidermists. And it's the results of this that he is, I think, going to give us tonight. So over to you, Pat. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for coming as well. Um, and I just wonder, can I ask how many of you have heard of the Hastings Rarities? Okay, so thank you. That's the younger people have not, and that's quite interesting. Um, for those of you who've heard of it will know the gist of the story, which is that um, uh, 50 years ago a paper was published, I'll show you in a minute, um, alleging a taxidermist called George Bristow imported um, foreign birds and, and sold them to gullible collectors for large amounts of money. And, and this distorted the ornithological record and was a scandalous process. So that's the gist of the story. And um, it was published in 1962 and since then the general attitude has been that this was a cut and dried issue, um, it's all over, uh, move on. And, and I've been criticised for basically raking it up yet again. And, um, uh, and, and also told that I'm flogging a dead horse. Um, so I'm very interested to see what, um, uh, what feedback I get from you this evening, because upon that depends what I do with this story. So in 1962, um, two papers and an editorial were published in a specially extended um, issue of uh, British Birds that you can have a look at here. Uh, afterwards, and um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to uh, refer to it as BB because I think this was a collective enterprise and also presumably there were um, other editors and um, uh, independent referees involved in this and so it's a, it's a collect they take a collective responsibility for issuing this challenge. <clears throat> They called it setting the record straight. So it's crucial to understand that the whole exercise is based on the concept of the area era. And the area in question was a 20 mile radius on some uh, Hastings Pier, which is around here somewhere in the middle. And, um, and you can see encompasses parts of uh, Kent and Sussex. And the era um, was from the 1890s through to about 1930. So a 30-ish year um, period of time during which it's alleged that an, or shown that an improbably large number of extreme rarities uh, were recorded. Next one. So these are the basic points that they were making. Um, the extraordinary numbers, um, human intervention fraud um, was alleged because there was no reasonable natural explanation for what was observed and 595 records from the area era were then uh, declared unacceptable and deleted from the ornithological record including a number of firsts for Britain uh, and of course then because it was fraud it was an, an assault on ornithological history if you like it was also pointed out that a, a disproportionate number, a large number of the specimens passed through the hands of the local taxidermist, George, uh, George Bristow, who lived in St. Leonard's. And therefore, that's the next logical step, therefore, if there was a fraud, he was responsible for it. <clears throat> An allegation, incidentally, that um, was made after he'd been conveniently dead for more than 15 years. Then after publishing this, they had a press conference. 
Now, why do they do that? And press conferences are commonplace now, but it was, it was quite an unusual thing to do in those days, especially when you remember this is about an argument to do with 50-year-old, um, what were then 50-year-old records of, of rare birds. A very arcane sort of discussion. Why have a press conference? Nevertheless, that's what they did, and this is what the press made of it. You can imagine that the, the newspaper reporters turned up, they've got to make a story somehow, and so this is the story they made. And that is what people remember, because I doubt if more than a few hundred people, if that, ever read the full paper in British Birds, these newspapers were seen by millions. And so this is what colours, I think, uh, a lot of what people imagine happened and what they believed at the time. <clears throat> So you can see it was, it was presented in a pretty alarmist form. Let's have the next one, which uh, refers to Mr. Bristow. Mr. Bristow's black lark. Black larks are a particular part of this story. And, um, and the Daily Telegraph is actually quoting Bristow here. Says George Bristow says he briskly sold 500 euro up to 300 pound a time. Bristow was dead. He couldn't have been giving an interview to the Telegraph. <laughs> and, and 300 pounds a time refers to a stuffed great hawk. And so, um, you know, it's complete irrelevance. But this is what was in the popular press seen by millions. Next one. Notice also um, the alleged prices paid for stuffed birds. <clears throat> this one um, here. Uh, Mr. Nicholson said yesterday that stuffed rare birds might fetch as much as 25 to 30 pounds a piece. Remember that? And up here, um, we, oh, we haven't got a price here quoted. Mr. Bristow, who happened to be a taxidermist, well, because that happens by chance. Anyway, remember the 25 to 30 pounds because explicitly in the original paper, BB made the assertion that um, the whole motive for this fraud was money, greed, getting loads of money from gullible collectors. So remember the allegation 25 to 30 pounds ago. No evidence was ever put forward in that paper uh, to justify the assertion, only a few bits of hearsay. Next one. So the problem is, I think, that um, it, everyone's accepted that paper, or I say everyone, most people have accepted it, and so now um, it's, a bit of pro it's, it's an established bit of, uh, of ornithological history. So we've now got a recent paper here referring to before Bristow, you know, like that was before, before the war, or before Queen Victoria or something. Um, it's accepting that there was a fraud and that Bristow was responsible for it. And the reason why this matters is because if you begin to write papers like this, um, calling into question old records, because, you know, we had this big fraud back in the... Uh, early part of the 20th century, you, know, you don't know what's going on. If you can't accept old records, then it makes it extremely difficult to study things like um, the effects of habitat change or climate change because you don't believe the stuff um, from which change has occurred. So that's one reason why this is actually important even to the present day and beyond the ornithology. Next one. It also matters um, because it's been accepted that this man was the great, one of the great fraudsters of the 20th century. And um, <clears throat> in the newspapers, quoting him as being uh, setting up an ornithological piltdown fraud equivalent. He's even got a blue plaque on his old shop. <laughs> and uh, he's the only taxidermist to be <laughs> acknowledged in that way. <clears throat> and so um, this is George Bristow. And it's a problem. Um, because uh, this, 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 ta this has tainted the whole taxidermy scene, if you like, and taxidermists are regarded with some suspicion, uh, sometimes rightly, I must admit, but quite often um, un unreal, uh, um, uh, unfairly. And, um, and as a consequence, we've now got some quite elaborate and expensive um, regulations to control what taxidermists do, which don't contribute an awful lot to wildlife conservation, but do actually add to the uh, bill. So when the paper was published in 1962, a number of people protested and wrote letters to British birds and so on. And um, the, the most vociferous of those was James Harrison, who published this book. You can have a look at it afterwards if you want. Uh, Bristow and Hastings Rarities. 
And uh, <coughs> yeah, I think this is actually a milestone in the social history of ornithology. It was a collision of the old guard versus the new. Basically, James Harrison was one of the old guard. He was a bird collector, and um, he, he, he was one of Bristow's long-term customers, and he really objected to um, the suggestion that Bristow was a crook and rejected the idea that was implicit in the original paper that lots of the pillars of ornithology had actually been uh, incompetent, inept, or even, cro even crooks. And so he took that very personally. Um, the BB's criticism was heavily based on uh, a statistical analysis we'll come to in a minute. And of course, Harrison had no idea what statistics were and said so. He thought, and he regarded p-values as being completely irrelevant. And so, yeah, there's a complete mismatch of, idea, of thinking. And because um, Harrison's text is rather long-winded and um, a bit old-fashioned, uh, a bit repetitive, it's easy to dismiss it, as many people did and have continued to do so. David Harrison, um, his son, um, told me several times that he thought this whole issue had um, been such a worry to his father that um, he had contributed to his early death. And I promised David long time ago that I would actually carry out a detailed critique of the original papers. Um, and I'm now doing that rather belatedly. And sadly, David is no longer with us. Of, ten years after James Harrison's death, another son, Geoffrey Harrison, took up the same story again and began to um, amass quite a large archive, actually, which includes a lot of important um, ornithological information that seems to have been overlooked by um, um, modern authors on the birds of Kent and Sussex. Geoffrey actually started to write another book about the Hastings rarities, including new material, but he only got three draft chapters done when he died, and I hope the same thing's not going to happen to me. Um, <laughs> You laugh, well, okay. <laughs> right, okay, so uh, let's move on. <laughs> so uh, what I'm not going to do is to try and revise the ornithology. I don't think there's any point in that because basically an awful lot of the birds that were thro thrown out and struck off the British list have actually been readmitted to the British list quite a lot of them to Kent or Sussex or both and the details are here. So I'm not going to argue about all that kind of thing. And um, what I'm concerned about is um, whether this was a fraud and, and what Bristow got to do with it. Next one, please. <clears throat> so I want to offer a defense of Bristow and that's the things I'm going to be covering. And to save a bit of time, we'll move on to the next slide because I'm going to cover all that, I hope. But starting with just giving you some more details about what was published in 1962. Um, BB's paper was quite long, and um, 30, 30 or 40 pages. And then there's a very long batch of, um, uh, of appendices with all the data they've been working on. So what it looks like is something like this. These are the list of species here, each one giving, uh, each individual specimen being given a Hastings rarities number the date it was collected, the place it came from, sex and all the rest, and you'll see that quite a few of those went through um, the hands of George Bristow. Um, they were seen in, in the flesh, fresh dead, by these people, reported, recorded, and published. And so that kind of information is there page after page of it, and that's what the analysis is based on, and that's what I'm going to be talking about as well. Next one. Now, the statistical case um, produced by Nelda was, um, he's, he's incidentally a very important statistician, a fellow of the Royal Society, and I feel very wary of actually um, challenging what he did. But nevertheless, I think there's things, questions to answer, and I've got someone answering them for me now. Um, but uh, what he did, what Nelda did, was to, to take the Hastings um, area, era up the top there, top left corner, and then Hastings area after the era, rest of Sussex during the era, rest of Sussex after the era, and so on. And then count up all these rec records of rare birds and do a series of chi-square tests on it to uh, uh, determine whether these differences in numbers were due to um, chance or not. And for the moment, all we need to worry about is you can see top right here a very large number of rare birds 
um, in the Hastings area era. Okay? And, and the particularly difficult thing, which Nelda paid strong attention to, um, <coughs> was that uh, if you look at class 1, 2, and 3 rarities, the class 3 rarities are sort of relatively common things, and these categories are based upon the frequency with which they've been recorded in the Handbook of British Birds back in the 1940s. And, um, and you can see here that class 1 rarities, the super rare things, were actually more numerous than the common rare things. Uh, <laughs> how can this be? And so, uh, and so that's, that's the sort of evidence that's been put forward here, supported by probability values. But can I just point out that statistical tests don't prove anything. What they do is to measure the probability of something occurring by chance. In this case, no chance of it occurring by chance, and therefore allegedly fraud. Uh, so no one is actually proving anything here, only showing that these birds were improbably genuine. <coughs> Playing with words, if you like, that actually is quite important. Critically, um, chi-squared tests work by comparing like with like. And one of the faults, I think, with this is here that um, at least twice in the, in the original paper, it's alleged that there was nothing special about the area that could account for the numbers. In other words, um, it was legitimate to compare like with like, including the Hastings area as being like the others. So I think we should look at that, next one, and think about the area. This is Sharrock's map here of breeding birds. This is the area in question. Within the first year of, um, of the mapping uh, project beginning, uh, Hastings, the Hastings Square was one of the best in the country for breeding birds. Um, if you look at the Winter Atlas, you can see again, um, it's, a good, it's a good place. And again, if you read the text, it highlights um, as though several other recent books, um, the, the, the quality of the Hastings area because of the extraordinary range of habitats there and also, of course, something like 60 kilometres of uh, coastline of different kinds lying right across the route of migrant birds coming from the continent. And so there were some sort of special things about this area which I, I think um, slightly challenged the idea of, of this being like the other areas. But the crucial difference is that this was such a good place for bird people to go, especially the collectors, some of whom actually lived locally, that this was a magnet for collectors who went there to look for rare birds. And they were competing with each other, bringing specimens to meetings like this to show each other and get the record published. And so that's why um, these things turn up so often in British birds, records in British birds, and also uh, in the BOC's own bulletin. And so you've got a sort of a, a self fueling system here, people stimulating each other to create records. And that wasn't going on in those other areas. So again, I think there's reason to say that we're not comparing like with like when you compare the Hastings area with the rest of Sur uh, Sussex and Kent. The other big difference is that the area, the Hastings area, included George Bristow. Next one, please. So. Oh, we'll come back to George. Let's, let's just take a little moment to think about Max Nicholson. He was the lead author of this um, uh, paper and, of course, a pillar of the naturalist community in this country, a very senior civil servant who was responsible for uh, setting up our national parks, our bird protection legislation, all the rest. I mean, he, he was a really serious bloke and a founder member of the BTO and um, WWF. Well, you know, there's a great long list of it. You can read his picture if you like. But in 1926, as a young man, he published this book, which includes some very intemperate remarks about collectors and taxidermists, and talking about the latter being like um, uh, receivers of stolen goods, and talking about seizing their assets and so forth. What should we do with them when they're unemployed? Well, you know, tough luck. Um, so he was, he, that was his mindset in 1926, and I think there's good reason to believe that that was in his mind all the way through to 1962. And so it took him a long time, but that's, I think, part of his motivation for writing this paper in the first instance, and also probably why they had the press conference. As a senior civil servant doing press conferences about other things, he could get the reporters in, and so that's what he got. And I think he, that was him, Max Nicholson, 
feeling that he once and for all nailed George Bristow. Next one. So let's talk about Lord Brist old Bristow. There's a quote from the paper, a great majority of specimens were handled by Bristow. That's actually 38%. Funny way to describe 38%. Many specimens were not handled by Bristow at all, but they're still on the list that are used to um, attribute fraud to him. Um, and also, Bristow was the only sig significant taxidermist for miles around. And um, <clears throat> what people don't realize is there were two George Bristows. This one, and his father, who was also called George Bristow, and, and his father had been trained by this man, Robert Kent, and took over Kent's business and ultimately passed it on to this George Bristow. So that even before the era began, there'd been a taxidermy business there in St. Leonard's for 50 years, with a long established network of, uh, of collectors, farm workers, gamekeepers, and all the rest, keeping a lookout for rare birds. And so that's something, again, special um, for this area, not, to, not found in the other uh, areas under question. Next one. Not too surprising that a large number of birds were handled by Bristow and Pack. One of the procedures which was accepted in those days was that um, birds, rare birds, would be seen in the flesh by um, a responsible ornithologist. So here's the people, about 20 of them there, who were. Um, no, it's about a dozen people in 20, in 20 different combinations. But anyway, um, you can see over 50% of the uh, um, Hastings rarities were actually seen in the flesh by these people in different combinations. And these aren't just sort of anybody off the street. There's two medical doctors there, two or three bird collectors who are very well aware of what skinning fresh dead birds is like and also acutely aware of the possibility of fraud and aware of the fact that if they authenticate these things, that gives Bristow a reason for putting his prices up. And these people, some of them have got a reputation to lose. One of them was the Mayor of Hastings and former Deputy Lord Lieutenant of Sussex. Um, there's a, there's a, a museum director there. You know, there's, these are serious people, in other words. Now, um, are we going to say that they are actually part of the fraud as well? Because that's not surely not likely. They're going, you know, why, why, how are they going to not be found out or have questions raised, given that this is going on for 30 years? Were they fooling themselves? Who knows? But these, a lot of these birds were seen in the flesh. Next one, please. Oh, go back. And a very important character in this story is Norman Ticehurst here. Uh, who was one of the verifiers. I think he checked 33 of the birds himself personally, either on his own or in combination with somebody else. And, um, and this is a transcript from one of his letters here <coughs> to um, James Harrison. Um, never mind the first paragraph here. He says here, during the period 1900 to 1916, I thrashed out the whole matter at different times with Howard Saunders, Baudler Sharp, Mead Waldo, Witherby and uh, Hartet, Rothschilds, taxidermist, collect, uh, museum man, and in 1952 with Bannerman. All were completely satisfied with the bona fides of the records. In conclusion, I can say that all that time, these people and I were constantly on the lookout for evidence of fraud. And later on, H.F. Uh, Griffiths from the Booth Museum, um, bought, who bought a number of the specimens uh, from Bristow, um, took special pains to follow up the historical details of all of them. And so, you know, this is, this is a fairly clear statement that they, would, they were not do, looking at this and, and having the wool pulled over their eyes easily. Next one. And also, we must remember that the, 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 the records that were used for the analysis in BB's um, paper there um, were shorn of their, of, their, of their details, their context. And if you look up the black lark, which is one of the more contested species, because this was the first record for Britain coming into this period. Um, if you look up black lark, you find that um, Tysost actually re recorded in the Birds of Kent that he looked at his diary and, and says that these birds were turning up at a time that the uh, centre of the European continent was enjoying or <laughs> was having um, the most severe winter uh, ever recorded, coupled with easterly winds. And I don't think it's too much to believe that a few of these birds got blown uh, across from the continent 
um, to, to, to Kent and, and Sussex, you know, why not? No, nope, struck them off, all of them. They're off the list, but the interesting thing is the black lark has been let back on to the British list on the grounds of a well-authenticated sighting of one in Anglesey. Now, if one can turn up in Anglesey, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't turn up um, in the Hastings area too. And it was complained that there were flocks of them. Well, okay, that's what these birds do in the wintertime. They gather together in flocks, so it's not surprising at all. So the context is missing from the analysis, um, which is just simply based on cold records. Next one. Okay, so this is another thing I want to emphasize, and again, simply, simply not been discussed before. These, these, this analysis is based on records, not occurrences. And the difference is that a record is an occurrence where something turns up and somebody thinks it's sufficiently remarkable to actually write it down and then send it off for publication. And then it goes to an editor who might say, well, that's nothing much, and throw it in the bin. Or he might be short of space. Or he might say, oh, that's interesting, and, and it becomes a record. So in other words, records go through a filtering process. And that could lead to this bias. Um, because if Hastings was such a good, a good area for birds, then a moderately rare thing, getting uh, written up and sent off to an editor, will be discounted as being something, nothing very special. We concentrate on the ultra-rarity things, which haven't been found before, and that's why you get this sort of disparity. It's a biasing factor there, because the analysis is based on records, not occurrences. And the next picture just shows you a hoopoo. Yes, there we are. Here's a hoopoo. Um, George Bristow's hoopoo here during the era Hoopoos are not even on the list of being rarities because you know, nothing on the south coast they turn up all the time. And so um, no one's actually recording hoopoos as a rarity because they're not rare enough. Next one. And I think this also explains part of the Hastings rarities in the seabirds department because um, there were semi-professional beachcombers operating at this time who would collect bits of fishing net and rope and bits of wood and stuff, anything that could be uh, sold that was washed up on the tide line. And they would actually bring in birds to Bristow. And these are some of the Hastings rarities here. And you think, well, wait a minute, how come they only found rare birds? Why didn't they find a few storm petrels? Well, they probably did. But no one's going to make a record of a storm petrel at Hastings. I mean, you know, that's nothing. Storm petrol in Tunbridge Wells, yes, and that's the rest of Kent, so it goes on the list. So you can see how that table I've shown you could actually easily be um, distorted by this kind of filtering process. Next one. <clears throat> uh, can we go back? Another problem which some people objected to at the time, many did actually, um, and, and I do as well, and that is that um, the original list of unacceptable records includes a lot of records which were definitely genuine. And BB accepted that. But what they said is that we can't tell the difference between a genuine record and a dodgy one, and so we put them all in. So as soon as you've got one species um, list on the list, any more for the era and area, go on the list as well. And so we've got things like this. This is a, a night heron which um, was done by George Bristow um, for his local butcher, a man called Hickman, George Hickman. And um, uh, Hickman wasn't a bird collector. He had only four birds, four, three birds in his collection. And this came to be via his granddaughter who knew George Bristow. And so this is undoubtedly genuine. It, came, it was shot by Hickman, not Bristow. Um, in Crowhurst, which is within the area, but just slightly outside the era, about 1930. So here's actually Bristow writing about it. Um, you probably can't see there. Someone asked him about night errands. I haven't had one for about four years, and that was shot at Crowhurst by Mr. George Hickman. He still has it. Who still has it? Okay, so there's a genuine night heron, okay, from the area. So why have we got seven night herons then? on the disqualified list. What's the justification for these? And the answer is that they're there because they were found within the area and the era. So there's another one added because it's the area and the era. And another one. And the more of these that you add, the longer the list gets and the greater the justification for adding still more. 
um, whether they're genuine or not. And this inflates the whole thing so that the Hastings Rarities affair is much bigger than actually really was. And even BB admitted that. <coughs> oh, sorry. And it affects. <laughs> well, that slide will do is this what I was going to say. Um, BB accepted this at the time that, they, that there was a problem with, with genuine records and then dismissed it as though it didn't matter. Well, it does matter because basically Bristow was being accused of, th of things that were nothing to do with him and were genuine. And also, um, the bigger the sample size, the easier it is to get uh, statistically significant probability values. So just having larger numbers makes a difference to the statistics. And this business of putting things on the list because they're on the list, I've suggested is rather a circular argument, not very scientific. And so there's a basic question, you know, was it fair to use genuine records to boost the case against Bristow? I don't think so. Next one. So that's another thing. Um, BB's paper actually listed 52 live sightings of rare birds and put them on the list as well as discounted records. And you think, well, well why? Surely if you've seen a live bird, that justifies the dead one. Because of the old saying, you remember, you know, the old, the old collectors would say, you know, what's, what, what's hit is history, what's missed is mystery. Because if you see a rare bird, no one believes it. If you shoot it, then they have to believe it. Well, this is the reverse. These are, these are live records which are being disqualified because that species occurs up on the list dead. That's back to front. And also, quite a lot of those, um, I think there's about 60 altogether, I can't remember actually, maybe half of that. Anyway, quite a lot of those birds are on the list of 595 as live sightings and also on the list of dead ones. In other words, they're double counted. That not only, again, enlarges the whole thing, but again, that's not the sort of thing you would expect of someone taking part in a, in a decent scientific inquiry. Double counting. Next one. There's also a problem that um, some of those live sightings were, were seen by very respectable people. This is one of them. She was a very keen ornithologist and went down for a holiday um, and was taken out by one of the local bird watchers and she saw several, I think three species, here we are, um, alive. And one of them got shot a few days later by someone else and is up as the uh, Hastings rarity. And so, uh, and the problem here is that BB doesn't seem to know, didn't seem to know that, or had ignored, um, the fact that these, this whole account was written up in some considerable detail in the Duchess's diary. Next one. And then you start looking at some funny, other funny things as well. This is, remember, this is the original map. And they, they, they extended it off to the, to the east here um, to include some bits out here so that so you've got a whole of Romney marshes included. That's fair enough, and they gave an explanation for that. What they've done here, though, down in the western bit, is to exclude this bit here. You can't see it from there very easily, but um, there's, a, there's a line that comes down here showing the edge of the area as they define it, which goes across like that, a curious little truncation which chops off that area. So why did they do that? That area, they used to call it the crumbles. It was a big area of, of shingle, um, pools, bushes, grass. It was a very difficult place to go and walk about, and I know that because I was there myself as a kid, and um, uh, now it's a housing estate and a marina. But anyway, that was described as one of the best possible collecting places um, by a keen local collector, Mr. E.C. Arnold, who was headmaster of Eastbourne College. And uh, he went there collecting rare birds, and he then produced a book, Birds of Eastbourne, in which he listed quite a few <coughs> rare birds, actually, and a whole load of others, which help to substantiate the list for the rest of the Hastings area um, and would have been an embarrassing thing for a BB to deal with um, because this rather undermines the case, particularly as none of these went anywhere near Bristow. So let's simply change the border and then we can exclude that. 
for which they gave no explanation. Next one. So anyway, this went on until the, the peak numbers in 1914 and 15 caused the editor of British Birds, H.F. Witherby, to um, issue a challenge to Bristow, saying to him, basically, we're not going to have any more of these record, rare bird records unless you have the bird seen in the flesh by um, uh, Ticehurst, Norman Ticehurst. <clears throat> Doesn't say whether Ticehurst agreed to it or not, but anyway, um, that, that, the gauntlet was down then um, to Bristow. And then the paper makes quite a lot of the fact that, that Bristow failed to do that. Um, he failed, he'd been found out. He was obviously guilty um, having been found out. That was the general um, argument that was put forward. <clears throat> it was also shown that after um, Bristow, uh, after Witherby's challenge, um, the numbers of birds reported from the Hastings area declined. Bristow had been found out. But actually they declined in the, other, in the rest of Sussex as well, if you look at Nelda's table. That wasn't referred to. Next one. <clears throat> so let's look at that. Um, here's the numbers of Hastings rarities per year. The peak years were in 1914 and 1915, which of course was the beginning of the First World War. And nowhere in BB's paper does it mention a world war. And then you can see the numbers decline. But nevertheless, um, there was still quite a large number altogether um, in the First World War. But this decline was put, was put forward as further evidence of Bristow's guilt and the fraudulent nature of what had been going on for a long time. Next one. Bristow had his own explanation for this. He said the problem was that all the young, able-bodied men in the villages had gone off to war. An unsubstantiated assertion which was just brushed aside and ignored. Well, I thought that was, a, that was a perfectly reasonable explanation. And so last week, my wife and I went down to the Hastings area, next one please, and we visited lots of the local churches, and, and, we, and we counted the number of war dead. There we are, 308 from just those small towns and villages. That's a big hit, a big number to be losing of your uh, able-bodied men. And remember, these are the ones who didn't come back. There were also those who went off to war and did come back. So there are actually more, far more than 308 people missing um, from these villages. So it's small wonder that the whole business of um, uh, collecting birds and having the network of shooters and so on um, died away. So I think Bristow's um, explanation is quite reasonable and borne out by the facts. Thanks, Tom. So. <sighs> The, the, the paper's full of this kind of thing. Um, commentary. You can read that one. Um, the odds against any one market gardener in an inland parish securing within a couple of years two Rupel's warblers and a Chetty's warbler are not only long, they're almost infinite. Well, leaving aside the fact that they counted Chetty's warblers as arch rarities, class one, we see them as common now. Leave that aside. What's being said here is that this is highly improbable. And, um, and, and a reason for not believing what we're, what we're seeing here. Well, okay, fine, but it's commentary. It's not actually evidence. If you want commentary, there's a book published in 1930 um, about shooting records in which there's a whole chapter about improbable events like that, including a man who tried to shoot a grouse and got a salmon as well. And um, <clears throat> uh, the, the Norwich taxidermist T. E. Gunn recorded in a personal memoir that was never published, so he wasn't boasting to anyone, that he'd once shot a blue throat and a great snipe, and a right and a left of his shotgun. Okay? So, okay. It beggars belief, doesn't it? We can all trade stories like that, but they've got no bearing on Bristow's guilt. Next one. So, um, once again, central issue um, of the whole accusation was that Bristow was making loads of money selling things to gullible collectors. No evidence at all was put forward in support of that. Very difficult to find evidence to support that, but James Harrison did. Next one, please. Uh, and so have I. Um, we're fortunate in that one of the collectors involved, and also one of the verifiers, as it turns out, um, 
was a man called J.B. Nichols, and he wrote in code what he paid for specimens. So this variant pochard over here um, is A pounds, B shillings. Okay? It's, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? A is one, B is two, so it's one pound, two shillings. I've checked that against the auction records, which in fact confirm that that bird was sold for one pound, two shillings. So we know we can use the, um, Nichols' code to work out what he paid for things from different places. So he has a pretty bad snipe, um, set up by Brazner, a taxidermist in um, Brighton, BF. B is two, F is six, that's two and sixpence, half a crown. I think it was robbed. I mean, you can see that um, we do have a way of seeing what was actually being paid using um, J.B. Nichols' collection, which was enormous. Next one. <clears throat> and so here we are. I brought it along, one of them, just so you can see one of these birds. Um, Red-footed falcon, blah, 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 all the details about it there. And on, on his label, Nichols has written uh, B stroke F. Uh, sorry, A, B, stroke F. So it's one, two, stroke six, 12 and sixpence. That is not an outrageous price to be paying for a fairly rare bird um, of that kind of size. So there's no evidence there, really, to support the idea, and they are hosting rarities, by the way, um, no evidence there to support the idea that Bristow was making loads of money. Remember the figures we were given earlier on? 25, 30 pounds per bird. James Harrison went down this route, um, sorry, Geoffrey Harrison went down this route, um, next one, and he got some more data. Uh, paid to Bristol by Nichols, and just skip all the details, average price, two pound 11 and sixpence. Average price, about three pounds 10 shillings, not 25 or 30 pounds. And these are for the Hastings rarities. Next one. The one person that I think Bristow was actually taking for a ride was Sir Fauncy Harper Crew um, up in Derbyshire. And here's, here's some of his birds. Um, and it, the average there is about £10. And um, Harper Crew was actually very vulnerable and very rich and easily taken for a ride. Bristow here was definitely um, uh, charging what the market would bear, so to speak. Um, but it's still a fraction of what was being alleged by BB long ago. So where's the evidence that this thing is all about greed and money? Next one. <clears throat> and the basic flaw in, uh, in the argument is that the more complex this operation is, and we'll see that in a moment, um, the more it costs. And the more it costs, the less profitable it is unless you charge enormous amounts of money, for which there is no evidence, and quite a lot of evidence, to the contrary. There wasn't a competitive scramble either, because the records all show that um, uh, Bristow took months to sell his birds sometimes. They didn't all go. And if you're going to allege that a smuggling network supplied them, the smugglers will be better off with something else other than dead birds. They're not making a lot of money here. Right, so how did he do it? Basically, if there's a fraud, how did he do it? And that is not even considered in the original paper. So let's look through, because the people who complained about the uh, BB's paper did actually come up with a lot of discussion, must have been irrelevant. One suggestion was that the birds, Bristow was importing stuffed birds from somewhere else and putting fresh labels on, but of course it doesn't account for more than half of them being seen in the flesh. So let's dismount, uh, discount that story. Next one. So, we're going to have some sort of collecting network. So you need field agents out there collecting the birds for you, for Bristow. Um, and they've got to be quite sophisticated ornithologists. It's no good saying collect rare birds, because if they're too rare, no one will believe they'll come in Britain at all. And um, uh, they've got to be things that just could possibly get to Britain occasionally. Someone's got to be quite a good ornithologist on three continents, because these birds are coming from um, central Central Palearctic, um, North Africa, and also North America. From North America, sometimes there were long gaps with nothing. Sometimes only one or two birds. Well, how can you, how can you keep a system going like that? There's no money in it for anybody. Um, and it all needs to be kept secret for 30 years, remember. Next one. How do you transport these birds? Well, there's been a lot of argument about that, and very confused argument about um, deep freezing. You can deep freeze birds these days. You couldn't then. 
deep freezing wasn't possible in those days, only limited short-term cooling um, on ice. And um, so, okay, where do you get ice in the Mediterranean in the summertime? Difficult. Costs money. Takes up space. Makes a mess when it melts. You know, there are difficult things about having things on ice. Next one. The most popular explanation, um, which doesn't really solve these problems, is that Rivisto was buy buying them from Leadenhall Market in London. But the collectors knew all about that because they were down the market as well. They were looking for these specimens. Bristow couldn't afford for even the slightest murmur to get out that he was there. So he's got to keep this secret um, for 30 years. Risk of discovery adds to the cost. Buying stuff from the market adds to the cost, diminishes the alleged massive profits. And it's not likely to account for the seabirds because, you know, this is a, a food market, not, <laughs> you're not bringing in sheer waters to eat. Next one, please. <clears throat> and so again, there's a problem about the war. Let's have a look at the war. It was over here, 1914 to 1918. If birds were being brought in to Leadenhall Market, how did they get here in 1915? I was down at the Metropolitan Archives the other day. Next one, please. And um, looking at... Oh, sorry. This is one of the problems why things didn't get here. Straight after the war, the war was declared, the Germans set up a blockade in which they, they issued a proclamation saying that anything found in these areas will be sunk, including neutral ships, and some neutral ships were some. And so how are you going to get birds in if this is that, we've got a blockade going on? Um, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't add up, does it? And, and if you're going to buy them from Leadenhall Market, okay, how did Leadenhall Market get it? Well, I was at the um, library the other day, next one, please. <clears throat> and you can, and the, the, the superintendent of markets put in a report each year on the tonnage of meat from different areas, and this is what you get from Europe. War was declared, and the tonnage imported from Europe falls by 93% in about 18 months at the time when the numbers of Hastings rarities is going up. I find that difficult to um, reconcile with the idea that Risto was buying in from Leadenhall Market. Next one, please. So I'm going to conclude by suggesting that Hastings was a bit of a non-affair, because if you actually take out the live sightings from the 595 dis disqualified records, or remove the well-authenticated genuine records, or remove those that Bristow didn't supply, or accept that the wartime records have to be genuine because they couldn't be brought in any other way. Um, or, if you, or worse still, if you, if you actually reverse Breebe's logic and say that if one of the species can be sh on the list can be shown to be genuine, then we take out all of them, then you finish up with only about 20 records which are suspect, spread over 30 years. So Hastings becomes a non-event. Next one. And since I was talking about Bristow, uh, we've had since uh, the Magna Carta, we've had a principle in this country that a man's innocent till he's proven guilty. There was no proof in the 1962 paper, no proof, only probability calculations and innuendo and suggestion, page after page of it. It was in the case against Bristow was inflated um, by genuine records and things that he didn't handle himself. And you can see there's other things, that the, the assumption that he was making loads of money, I've just demonstrated, um, is false. And there was no evidence to the contrary provided at the time. And, uh, and I'm saying also that the unquestioning acceptance of Bristow's guilt has distorted things even to the present day. So there you are. Um, I think that's the last slide. Yes, there we are. It was the last one. Um, it may... <laughs> It is possible that Bristow did do a bit of fiddling. I don't think it's very likely, but I think it's possible. But there's no actual evidence that he did. And the practicalities appear insuperable. And actually, the real last slide suggests that um, he was just in the right place at the right time. So thank you um, for listening. What do you think? <laughs>